How you guys doing? Great. Um, no time to lose. John chapter 2. Okay. Yeah? Let's do it. <clears throat> uh, my goal for the next two sessions is we're just going to do an aerial tour in this session of these uh, two sets of four Rembrandt portraits. Uh, and then we'll use the next session to go through themes in the uproom discourse and the, and the passion uh, and the empty tomb. So uh, this section right here, so I already walked you through how he's the bookended, remember? Cana, Cana, the portico, the portico. This is all feasts. Um, this is all key cultural symbols. Um, and just like we saw in the introduction, um, every, I mean, just John, he sees everything in light of Jesus. <laughs> That's just the decoder ring. Um, so whether it's the Lamb of God or the tabernacle or the seed of Abraham or the seed of the woman or God's creative word or the light shining in the darkness. Right, you with me? He just, he takes everything in the Hebrew scriptures as a way of illuminating it, it, it's what makes sense of Jesus and these events that took place and also brings those themes to their perfect fulfillment, at least in his view, that's his claim. So uh, he's going to do the same exact thing here. He's intentionally um, choosing events that took place at these places and times because John wants us to see a connection between the meaning of each one of these and it illuminates some aspect of Jesus' character or his mission. So every one of these is handpicked and really um, intentional. And there's almost always a network of hyperlinks going back to Hebrew Bible text for each one of these. So I'll kind of point some out. Um, but there you go. That's our mission, should we choose to accept it. And you're here now, so you've already accepted it, I guess. Um, let's see. Chapter 2. Yep. All right. Let's uh, just survey the first portrait here. So on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Yeah, there's no time. I have this thing in the notes. Um, in chapters 1 and 2, John has, this is all Richard Balcom, by the way. Uh, it's a chart on page 7. John has, if you've been paying attention in, through chapters 1 and 2, He's very careful to mark the sequence of seven days in John 1 and 2. It starts here, and you just watch. He marks every single day in chapters uh, 1 and 2. And then the moment you get to Bethany, oh yeah, the seven days culminate in Bethany. And then the moment you hit this Bethany, this whole block takes place in how many days? Can you guess? Seven, he architects this whole thing as seven days. So seven days leading up to the first sign. Seven days after the last sign leading up, oh, excuse me, after the sixth sign leading up to the seventh sign. So it's, what on earth? Anyway, so, but no time. So look at the chart. Anyway, there you go. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus' mom is there. Right, well-known story. And uh, they're invited to wedding. And the focal point of the wedding is the thing that brings the celebration to the wedding they don't have, namely wine. So Jesus uh, ends up taking enormous amounts of wine held in these large purification water jars and the water is transformed, not just into wine, but then the story really slows down to talk about the quality of the wine, yeah? The culminating moment of the story is, uh, normally, once everybody's drunk, you bring the low-quality wine. You've saved, and notice he's, it's the whole thing, the first, first, and then the last. And you have kept the good for uh, last. That's the thing. And then the summary is, hey, dear reader, here is the first sign that Jesus did. Um, I, I, we did this in the John video. So look at all these countdowns he's starting. You've got the seven-day thing you're supposed to be keeping track with. That's like read through number 17. 
uh, and uh, read through 18, you got to keep track of the signs. Because uh, he's going to start counting down this, uh, the signs for you as well. This is going to be sign number one. Anybody remember sign number two? It's the healing of uh, the centurion's son, which happens kind of like down here in this uh, little mini story packed in here. Um, and then, and he tells you this one, he says, this was the second sign. He just says it. So he's teaching you to count the miracles Jesus does. And then he stops counting. And he just tells you, he'll just say, hmm, here's another. He'll, oftentimes it'll be someone else calls something Jesus said a sign. But he's just going to plant them all the way through leading up to the last uh, sign in this section, uh, which is the raising of Lazarus. And then silence on the signs until this. Um, the empty tomb, the seventh sign. And you know it's a sign because all the way back here, Jesus said that um, uh, his death and resurrection destroy the temple. What sign will you give us? Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. So here he t already tells you that this is going to be the ultimate sign. So the sign, that's a whole thing you can follow through. And there's seven, of course, of course there are. <laughs> you know, it's seven days, seven, so anyway, it's amazing. Okay, so just think about what's happening here. John wants you to know that Jesus, a revelation of Jesus' glory, it's the second time the word occurs, glory. So the overabundance, the beauty and power of the creator God's presence was manifested by making great wine at a wedding. Amen. Come on. <laughs> and I, this isn't about like getting over the prohibition stigma or whatever. So just think, just forget all that. This wasn't written for Americans in mind, you know? So like, so the revelation of divine creativity and beauty and glory, the first narrative is of Jesus rescuing a wedding from going bad by providing the ultimate wine at the last moment. That's the, right? That's the whole theme here. You've saved the good wine until the very last moment. And this is a sign. So do you see that word standing there in verse 11 is telling you the narrative you just read is a symbol. It's a sign. That's what sign means, yeah? It's a symbol. Um, so then you're just supposed to go for a long walk and have a cup of tea and think about what it means for the best celebratory element, the wine. Um, and so think in terms of Old Testament, wine. Um, where does it come from, obviously? Grapes. grapes. Um, what are wine, grapes, what's that a symbol of in Israelite Old Testament worldview? If you've got lots of grapes, right? <laughs> Abundance? Um, when is the land abundant? So if God's people are faithful to the covenant, then you have lots of abundance, right? Um, uh, do grapes play an important role in symbolizing the abundance of the promised land? That story of the spies, the huge right cluster of grapes. There's all that going on. So wine, so grapes and wine have uh, you know a prehistory that you can trace right through the Hebrew Bible. Um, and there's multiple, oh, there's that again. I'll just, I'll, say, I'll just save that one, keep that one. Uh, but there is one particular, let's see, do I have this in the notes about the, yeah, there it is. Um, in Isaiah 25, it's a beautiful um, poem about uh, the new Jerusalem in the Messianic kingdom. Now, here's the, it's Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 8. Just read it, and you'll see what's going on here. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. What's this mountain? In Isaiah, anywhere, this mountain. <laughs> it's Jerusalem, right? The new, and here it's the restored Jerusalem. A banquet where the, the, the main event is that aged wine with choice pieces of marrow, the best meat with the bone in it, right? refined aged wine. On this mountain where people are eating and swallowing, God himself will do swallowing. And what is he going to swallow up? 
He's going to swallow up this covering like a veil stretched over all of the nations. He's going to swallow up death. So in the New Jerusalem, it's this beautiful double, it's like riffing on swallowing in two ways. Right? The people are swallowing the abundance of the new creation while God himself is swallowing up the thing that has prevented that from happening, which is uh, death, depicted as this wet blanket right, over everybody. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. You know that one? You probably know it from its New Testament appearance. It's, it's in the New Jerusalem in, in Revelation uh, 21. He just uh, hyperlinks that, this very phrase. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all of the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And here's the song that we'll sing in that day. Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we've waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now, now this itself, whenever God's people break out and say, ah, oh, this is our God, rejoice in his salvation. Within the Hebrew scriptures, that's always... Whenever you're singing about God's salvation, you're hyperlinking back to the foundation salvation event in the foundation celebration song. You know it? Yep. Yeah. It's, you're always connecting back to the song of the sea here in Exodus 15 where you're rejoicing in God who is your salvation. My God is our God. So um, there's always like new Exodus things happening. The new Jerusalem will be a result of a new exodus. And the main event, all the, to bring it all the way back here, is uh, the wine. <laughs> it's the wine, right? When God becomes the unique God of his covenant people again. This is our God. That's covenant marriage language, right? I will be your God and you will be my people. So this is a reunion of, of the covenant people in the New Jerusalem and wine. There you go. That's for sure what's, why John is placing uh, this up front here. So I'm just going to put wine here. Wine is this rich, rich image of New Jerusalem, uh, of the New Covenant, of abundance, promised land. I mean, my God, it's of, of the Garden of Eden, right? It's a garden image, right? Of garden abundance. There's so many things resonating here. Um, now, wine is going to be a really important symbol, though, too, because wine is also um, a symbol of what other red liquid? <laughs> of blood, yeah. Um, so just keep tabs on that, because the wine blood motif is going to keep, keep going, too. So, so here we're talking about, um, I mean, you, just have, you, have to, you have to give a message on this, right? Um, so this is about um, wine is a symbol of so many things, right? Of abundance, of Eden, New Jerusalem. You've got uh, Isaiah 25 in the mix there. Um, and it's all about, um, it, within the wedding narrative, it's the best was saved for last. So in, in terms of a way of the way the biblical authors think in terms of history, it's like this, the best was saved for last. It's like the secret weapon, <laughs> something, right? The secret um, the, the moment it happened, it was like, of course, this was where it was all going. But what, it was hard to see it before. He just tells you. We had no clue what he was talking about when he actually said, this temple is, right, destroy this temple. But now we can see. So this waiting until the last, and then it all came true, and it was the perfect solution that we would have never thought of. We're in that ballpark here. Are you with me? that view of the culmination of history. So the wedding. Uh, there's probably more going on with the wedding uh, than I even realize right now, but those are my current thoughts. And what a wonderful story to start the signs. Yeah? So good. Um, the temple stunt is what follows. That's what I call the temple stunt. 
John 2. Um, so temple, sheesh, is this an iconic symbolic space? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to imagine a more symbolic kind of space. It's like the White House and the National Cathedral, right? right? And it's just every national, religious, cultural symbol all packed into one location. And uh, it's Passover, for goodness sakes. So Jesus storms in, and he does his thing. Um, you know the story. But notice particularly, if it's, um, if it's Passover, then this is all about a whole series of animals and, and, uh, that are going to be sacrificed. And what John highlights, especially, you know, the money changers, but he also highlights the money changers are just facilitating the purchase of what? Of, of the animals, the sacrificial animals. Why are people traveling to Jerusalem for Passover? To sacrifice their, their animals for Passover. And so Jesus, he's interrupting the whole Passover. And even if it was only for a couple hours that he shut the system down, he shut the system down. <laughs> um, it's like running into a meeting of Congress while they're passing law and just like, none of this today, you know? And even if you get ushered out in 20 minutes, it takes 20 minutes, you shut down Congress. And that's a, it's a symbolic action. Are you guys with me? here. So, um, which isn't, this, this has nothing to do with Jesus being anti-Jewish or something. So, but it does have Jesus being um, anti-covenant faithlessness, uh, anti-covenant uh, violation. So the whole view is that the temple leadership is corrupt. They're in the pockets of Pilate and of the Romans. And it's it's, a far, it's become a farce. It's precisely because Jesus believes in what the temple is supposed to represent that he's so angry in doing what he's doing. Are you with me? So it's, it's actually, it, it's very similar um, to the people who produce the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, who if you were to read their writings and not know that they were Jewish, you would be like, these are the most anti-Semitic people, right? But, it, it, but they're Jewish, Right? That are producing the Dead Sea Scroll. The whole, and so this is, they're as anti Semitic as Jeremiah is anti Semitic when he's accusing the corrupt Jerusalem. Are you with me? They're actually the most pro covenant people you could have around you. It's precisely because they believe in God's covenant with the family of Abraham that he's so ticked off at what's happening here. And so. Um, the, gospel, the irony is the Gospel of John often gets accused of being a seedbed for anti-Semitism, and it has in Christian history by Christians who don't understand Judaism. <laughs> um, and so they misread this prophetic critique as somehow saying, aren't we glad the Israel thing's over now and we can do the Jesus thing? And that's just a fundamental misunderstanding. You guys tracking with me? I mean, because it's the seed of Abraham. That's the family that we're creating here. It's the, it's the family of God. It's, okay, anyway. So, uh, the symbol. So, notice what Jesus does. Just like the wedding, Jesus' wedding and the wine um, becomes the symbol of what he's doing and the messianic age he's beginning. Um, this this uh, moment of Jesus in the temple becomes a moment for him to say that the physical building of the temple was always meant to be a, po a pointer a sign, a symbol to something greater. And of course, Jesus is claiming that the ultimate reality is himself. The temple is his body. So he uh, performs like a prophetic sign act, like Jeremiah, right? Standing in the temple and critiquing Israel. Or you remember he puts on like that underwear and then takes off the dirty underwear and hides it under a rock. You guys read Jeremiah recently? It's weird, right? <laughs> or the pots that he shatters and so on. It's like that. This is like Ezekiel going out in public and tying himself up. And, and uh, people are like, what? what are you doing? It's a prophetic sign act, and it's intentionally symbolic. So he's declaring that the temple um, is going, moving towards shutdown, and the real purpose of the temple is going to reach its fulfillment in in his body. Now, have we had temple language on the brain already? Remember the, here we go. 
the word became human and tabernacled and we saw the glory. And so now we've got this whole thing again. So I already have the word temple. Um, how do we... It's a sign. The temple is a sign. He talks about how this thing is the sign. Um, and it's, it's a specifically pointing forward to the moment where you are going to destroy this temple. And I'm going to raise it up again. So the purpose of the temple is going to be fulfilled in a way that the people who are now working in the corrupt temple, they won't even know that they're fulfilling the purpose of the temple when they're killing Jesus. There's like this reversal and irony there. Um, so uh, what would a, a message about the temple is a message about God's desire to, the temple is where heaven and earth it's a little mini Eden inside, yeah? It's a symbolic space where you recall what we're made for. And it also is a symbolic way of showing that God's not letting go of our world. Like he's firmly entrenched his grip and he's not going to let heaven and earth be divorced. Even if um, he allows us to create Babylon everywhere else, he keeps a foothold in what, this one spot. And so that's what, that's what Jesus is. This is a physical space that points to the bigger story of heaven and earth. Um, so th something along those lines is what you want to do in a message like this. Bring out Jesus as, he's like the ultimate, uh, in, my, in my opinion, um, people who are doing the kinds of things that Jesus was doing, he's like an activist. People who do these provocative public acts and then say puzzling riddles to point to the meaning of those acts. That's what Jesus is doing here. Um, I think hip hop, hip, the role of hip hop in American culture is a close equivalent <laughs> to, are you guys with me? Provocative? Say that. Pro I will, and I am. <laughs> you say it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's it. And so it's like, am I okay with that? Am I not? The, who cares if you're okay with it? The point is something shocking to get you thinking about the most important things in life. That's the, the role that these figures play. And so the, the prophetic sign act um, stuff is so cool, tying that to um, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. That's awesome. Um, and then the meaning of the temple as a, a symbol of the marriage of heaven and earth. Um, is why Jesus goes for the space and why he does what he does right here. Uh, this is supposed to be the place that be that's a symbol of what the whole story is about and it's become uh, corrupted. And then it's another way of Jesus uh, fulfills the biblical story and symbols in a surprising way. He's going to die. Somehow he's going to die. And that is going to fulfill uh, what the temple was going on, what was about. If you think and pray about it longer, you'll probably have even more ideas. But continuing the aerial tour, all right? Um, where does he, oh yeah, this is really cool. How, tra how two transitions into three. I like this one. Um, so then Jesus is just hanging out after he pulled a stunt. And lots of people believe in him looking at the signs he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, uh, now this is great. So many people believe in him. Do you know the Greek word? Pistuo. Pistuo. So many people pistuo in Jesus. But Jesus... He doesn't pistuo in anybody else. <laughs> and our English translations do it in trust, which is a trust. But it's this great irony. People trust in him. He doesn't trust humans. <laughs> it's so good. Because he, he, knows, he knows humans. In fact, he doesn't need anybody to testify about humans. Humans need someone to testify about him. But he doesn't need anybody to launch a case against humanity. It's it, the history. Our, our history is that. He, he knew what's in humans. Now, there was one particular human. 
you get the sequence? One particular human, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and he came by, he came at nighttime. It's the first nighttime event in the gospel. So it's such a, such a great seamless transition there. And so in other words, John is setting you up to have what kind of posture towards Nicodemus? Do you see? Suspicion. Right? People believe in Jesus. Oh, yay, Jesus. He does signs and wonders. But Jesus doesn't believe in people. Right? Because he knows what people are like. In fact, there was one people who came to see him that night and then it goes on. So that's John's way of stacking the deck of the narrative. And so uh, Nicodemus, this is amazing. So this is Jesus talking with, it's as if he's having a conversation with the leadership of Israel of his day. That's what Nicodemus represents. He's the teacher of Israel. You remember? That's what he calls him. And what's great is this conversation um, involves, it's, it's the first really, really weird conversation where Jesus never says a straightforward response to what Nicodemus is saying. Um, and there's lots of word plays and puns happening in the conversation. But it's essentially, it's this. It's Jesus talking with the leadership of Israel in his day. That's what Nicodemus represents. <clears throat> so, look at, Nicodemus comes and butters him up, right? Well, surely you've come from God. Look, you can look at the magic tricks, right? And no one could do that. And Jesus just, he just cuts right through it. He just cuts right through the politicking, yeah? And he's just like, get a life. Literally, get a life. <laughs> um, now, there's, do you know about the wordplay here with again? Do you know about this? This is, this is significant. Um, and, and actually, do I? This is in the John document. Yep. Sorry, just one line for this story. Sorry. Just never enough time. Okay, so uh, this word, uh, again, so I'm going to go back to the sermon doc. And this is, this is actually kind of a fun one to do with people. I've done this in the sermon before too. So this word again, um, the Greek word is anothen. And there are, there's actually two, depending on the context you use it in, um, there's two distinct nuances of what the verb is. It can be, again, in terms of another time. So that's one distinct nuance. However, the word can also mean from above. So ano, meaning uh, above, and then, whence. From, so literally from above, and then from above became an idiom for again, or another time. Um, so which meaning does Nicodemus take Jesus to intend? How? What? <laughs> and so the question is, did he understand rightly? What does Jesus go on to say? What, what are you talking about? He just doesn't even acknowledge Nicodemus' response. He just goes on to try and say it another way. It's one interesting thing. Um, another interesting thing is that this word anothen is going to be used another time. And uh, I should have done the search already. Sorry. Sorry. To, everything's going to be fine. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to search on it here because it occurs... Yeah, here it is. It occurs later in the same chapter, verse 31. Um, well, this is where John the Baptist is talking about Jesus, and he says, the one who comes anothen is above all. He who is of the earth is of from the earth and speaks from the earth, but the one who comes from heaven is above all. So here's the same exact word being used in the next story. And it clearly here means from above. Are you, with, are you tracking with me? Okay. So in other words, what, what this means, I don't, 
um, once this, this whole conversation began to click for me, actually, is that our English translations have adopted Nicodemus's misunderstanding as the translation. Do you see that? So what does Jesus mean when he says being, you have to be born anothen? He could mean again, or he could mean from above. Now do I have a category about the new family needing to be born from God or from God's will? Are you with me? From, and where's God, where does God rule the world from? Right, that's the image of heaven. He's above all. So the, what Jesus is, is talking about is a life that comes as a gift from God. Anothen, from above. But he says it in a word that's ambiguous. <laughs> and then Nicodemus is supposed to be portrayed here then as misunderstanding the point. So Jesus' second follow-up here isn't like a new train of thought. It's the same thing, just with a different metaphor. So instead of Adathan, he says, okay, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let's try again. So water and the Spirit. Um, so again, for Bible nerds, um, the moment you hear water and spirit and are thinking about Israel being recreated, reborn. Water, spirit, rebirth of Israel. Anybody? Ezekiel? Ezekiel? Anybody? Ezekiel 36. God's going to create a new Garden of Eden in Ezekiel 36. Uh, he's going to regather, um, the, right? He scattered them for defiling the land. This is verse 19. So say to the house of Israel, I'm about to act for the sake of my name. I'll vindicate my holiness because you guys made Yahweh look like an imbecile in the eyes of all the nations by how you behaved. So I have to prove myself holy independently of you now. Darn it. But when I do that, I'm going to bring you back from all the nations. I'm going to sprinkle water on you. So uh, do you remember Ezekiel's profession? What he would have been if he didn't get exiled? He was a priest. So it's all ritual purification. This is, this is like talking about fishing. If you're a fisherman, this is talking about your certain kinds of tackle. It's just like the standard stuff you do, how you clean a fish. All you have to do is mention water in a group of priests and you know what you're talking about, right? So clean water. This is the purification waters talked about in the book of Numbers. So I'll sprinkle water on you. You'll become ritually pure. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. My spirit within you, yeah? And, and when I create the new covenant family through water and the spirit, you'll get an obedient family of covenant partners, right? You're walking in my statutes. And then, this is Ezekiel 36. What's the next chapter in Ezekiel? 37? You're learning something right now. 37 comes after 36. Oh yeah, what is, what is Ezekiel 37? It's the valley of dry bones, which is about what? The creation of new humans, born from above. And, and b born by means of who? By means of the Ruach. The whole chapter is about God's Ruach entering and creating new humans. So for sure, for, like without a doubt, um, Jesus is activating the new birth, new human stuff from Ezekiel. So you have to be born from above as a gift from God. Oh, I don't get it. What do you mean? All right, let's try this. Standard prophetic new creation stuff. That which is born of flesh is flesh. God said in Ezekiel 36, I'm going to take out your fleshy heart. Right? And give you the spirit-empowered heart. But what's born of spirit? Ezekiel 36 and 37? We're, now we're talking. New humans who love God and love their neighbor. Don't be amazed that I say you must be born anothen. Have you read your Bible, Nicodemus? Right, and, but listen, the spirit, like, we don't get to program the way the spirit works. God's freedom is to work in the ways and the timelines that he chooses. That's how it is. 
with people recreated by the Spirit. Oh, huh? I don't understand. What, uh... Do you get it here? So, that, so for John's portrait here, the whole, it's very similar to this, right? This is supposed to be the place where heaven and earth meet and God meets with his people. It's corrupt. These are supposed to be the people who, right, are leading the covenant people into faithfulness and understanding. And this guy doesn't, he doesn't get it. Um, so it's a very, very similar type of theme here. Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? And then what unfolds is a long speech of Jesus that uh, leads up to John 3.16. Don't leave out this story when you teach. Through <laughs> this is so good. Um, so, so you have a conversation here between Jesus and Israel, corrupt Israel, Israel that needs to be reborn, just like the prophet said that they did. And it's this amazing conversation because look at, like, it starts with Nicodemus wanting to dance with Jesus. Do you see this? He's wanting to politic. Like, come on, you know, clearly you're a man sent from God. You can do signs. Surely God is with you. And Jesus is just like, get a life. Uh, this isn't the way that you're doing the covenant here is dead. It's just like you're dead. And so what we need is to be born again of God's gift through the Spirit and then ultimately John 3.16 uh, as the gift of God's love. Are you with me? So good. Such a great, it's a, yeah, it's great. It's awesome. It's John 3. Um, there's other stuff going on in John 3, but that's, uh, so this is about um, Nicodemus. Uh, is a, he becomes an, an icon of is the same uh, Israel that Jeremiah was accusing and, and Ezekiel was of the, the failed covenant uh, partners. But he's a leader and it ought not to be this way. <clears throat> um, and so Jesus uh, is advocating the new covenant which is about spirit and new birth. Boom. From here, Jesus goes to chapter 4, all the way up through Samaria. And uh, this is an amazing story. Um, may, I think I'll just give a, a quick set of thoughts about this. First of all, it's all about water. Yeah? And about how people drink from existing wells and they get thirsty again but they have the opportunity to drink from a well and never thirst. And then he develops it, they can have opportunity to drink from a well and never die. Are you with me? And th this whole thing, uh, the water, we've already been exposed to water that is transformed into the life of the party, right? Here, and here it's water that can transform people into uh, eter eternal life. Um, and so just keep an eye on that water symbol because it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up again here. Um, but, but I think the most timely thing to focus on, and I, all I, have, I'm just, I have to say 30 seconds worth and you're going to get it. This is the most uh, charge story for addressing issues of race, of socioeconomic uh, inequities, and gender inequities. <laughs> a Samaritan woman, right? Um, w women, uh, it's a peculiar Western thing when we read the story about this woman and suspect her as the wrongdoer. Are you with me? Women can't initiate divorce in ancient Judaism. If she's been married five times, are you with me? Are you with me? I just read the Torah. Right? <laughs> Women can't initiate divorce. They don't, and they didn't. So, so that's an intentional depiction of her, not as a whore, as a victim. So as a victim of abusive men, that's the first portrait. She's Samaritan. She's the object of racism by their Jewish neighbors to the south. Um, 
and she's been abandoned by uh, her husbands, which is, it's, uh, she's been abandoned by her husbands. She's also in a, a very difficult economic situation. Are you with me? And this is the woman Jesus moves towards to have a conversation about. It's just like, so um, depending on your church community, the, the way, what particular boundary lines activate the scandal of the story, you're going to have to find a creative way um, for your setting to, to create the equivalent, right? And it'll be different in different neighborhoods. <laughs> it'll be different in different cities and so on. But don't miss the chance to let Jesus r really speak to your communities in an important way here. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Cool. Great. Because um, it's very easy to ignore that stuff and just make it about theology, you know? Um, or vice versa, um, to leave out the incredible right, theological depth of Jesus as water of life um, and only focus on those boundary line issues. And the whole point is both. Those are precisely the things that are overcome when we all are coming to the same well for the water of life. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. So that's, uh, that's four, chapter four. Um, yeah, here I'll just say, don't mess this one up. <laughs> Great opportunity uh, to talk about sensitive issues of race, economics, and gender. Okay. Uh, one through four. And are you guys starting to get the feel of it? One thing at the center stage, it's a symbol pointing forward to this. Um, oh, yes, because Jesus has a f other sheep than in this fold he wants to gather in. Yeah? That's what we're talking It's a Samaritan. And then the whole village of Samaria believes. Yeah? And then right here, a whole bunch of Greeks believe. John tells you the story about all these Greek people who want to see Jesus and start following him. And then when he's lifted up, he draws all humans to himself. That's another soccer ball moving down the field, is this universal reach. Because the light shines and illuminates just some humans. Do you remember? It illuminates every human. Yeah, there you go. Dude, so good. Holy cow. Okay, when, is, when, am I supposed, when is this session supposed to be over? <laughs> but I, I want to... Oh, oh, per oh, that's great. Cool. That's great. I thought it was like five minutes. So that's great. Okay. Um, okay. Let's, let's just, here. This is just going to take two seconds. Jesus walks into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. He heals the guy on the Sabbath. You know the story? The pool. Oh, it's a pool. The waters of healing, but the guy can't get to the waters of healing. But are the waters the thing that heals? Who's the real water? It's Jesus. Right? That was the, just the last story. And so here's a guy trying to get to actual water for healing. And Jesus is just like, what? What do you need the pool for? All right? So, so he's, because he's the water. Um, but it happens on the Sabbath, right? And then can you guess what is the key controversy here? Working on the Sabbath. Right? The guy carrying his mat, and the, he did this on the Sabbath. So this whole thing turns into a controversy about working on the Sabbath. Yeah? That's, this is John 5. This is so good. This story is so awesome. So, um, so it starts with water, and then it becomes a thing. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Hey, it's a Sabbath, right? So Jesus uh, has hidden himself, and then afterwards Jesus finds him, and then they start this conversation, and then Jesus is, is exposed in public. They start persecuting him because he's doing things on the Sabbath, and then he drops this bomb right here. You know, my dad works on the Sabbath. <laughs> so just watch this. My, my father works on the Sabbath. I work on the Sabbath. Do you get it? So you remember this whole thing. It's that same, well, he's God and distinct from God. <laughs> so Jesus just worked on the Sabbath, worked on the Sabbath. And, and actually, even again, just to make this clear, what he's not, he's not doing away with Sabbath. He's doing away with a common interpretation of Sabbath 
according to rabbinic scholarship of his day. Which, um, if uh, the com commentaries will have a whole thing on this in the in the Jewish literature of the period called the Mishnah, there's all these really s detailed specifications of what constitutes work on the Sabbath, and that's what Jesus is taking issue with, not the Sabbath. And, and again, it's a sign, yeah. So, for in Jesus' mind, this is developed in M Matthew, Mark, and Luke too. The idea of somebody becoming whole and complete on the Sabbath day, Jesus is like, oh, let's. That's the perfect way to celebrate Sabbath, right? Um, it's completeness and wholeness. So Jesus is pro-Sabbath, right? Uh, he's pro a different interpretation of Sabbath than these guys. Okay, so that he, then he drops that bomb, and then it's just like, oh, they want to kill him. But look at what they get it. Not just because he's violating Sabbath, but why? Well, my father works on the Sabbath. If you see me working, you see my father working. It, and so he just says it, making himself um, equal with God. So they, they pick it up. And then this whole thing um, becomes this debate about um, his relationship to the father. And he goes on, so the father raises the dead, so I raise the dead. The father actually doesn't judge anybody. He gives that over to the son. Ooh, he gives judgment to the son. Anybody? He gives judgment. This is all Daniel 7. It's all Daniel 7. When the Son of Man is exalted up, he rules at the right hand of God and judgment is given to, to rule the world. It's the image of Adam. The image of God ruling, judging over... Anyway, the whole biblical story. So anyhow, so this whole thing turns into a debate about... So look at how this works. Sabbath becomes into a, a debate about work. And then the working allows Jesus to start doing this thing here. So I'm just going to put the triangle underneath. The Father, Spirit, Son. When you see Jesus performing his signs, you are seeing uh, the complex unity that is the God of Israel revealed in and through the, the human Jesus. Sabbath. Yeah? Uh, what's the next story? It's the Feast of... Passover. Now, this is really interesting. Um, so, Passover. So, you would think it's going to take place in Jerusalem. But where does, it, where does the whole story get, uh, get set? Do you remember? Just in the wilderness. Uh, out in the wilderness. And Jesus, what does he provide for all these crowds of people in the wilderness? Bread. Yeah? Bread. So, he provides all this bread in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then people are stoked, and they come back, and they want him to do more signs. <laughs> uh, give us more bread. And then Jesus says, you know, when you eat from this bread, you'll get hungry again. Yeah? When you drink of the water, you'll get thirsty again. When you eat of the bread, you'll get hungry again. And then he goes on to say, no, the bread is me. I'm the true bread. Do you, and it comes into this conversation about manna. Because they're like, oh, well, we, our fathers had manna. And Jesus says, I'm the manna. <laughs> so he's the bread from heaven, from above. Yep. It's just all, dude, yep. poof, this thing's locked tight, dude. So, okay, so and then this whole, all of a sudden, eating bread. And then wa watch, this is actually uh, um, the way the story cu uh, culminates here in John chapter 6. <clears throat> so the people are like, what? What do you mean, eat? Um, so they were grumbling, What? He, you're the bread from heaven? I don't get it. Um, so Jesus says, oh yeah, don't grumble. So you have Israel grumbling in the desert because the bread that they're getting isn't the bread that they want. <laughs> it's so good. Anyway, you're just like, oh, this could be Exodus 16 or... Anyway, so, um, so I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna and died. This is the bread. Okay, watch the progression here. This is really important. This was, uh, I think Richard Balcom had a chapter on this. I forget. Watch the progression. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven. What is the bread that comes down out of heaven? Look, at, this is going to be this poetic logic. I'm the bread. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven. What is the bread? Jesus is the bread. If you eat of the bread that is Jesus, you don't die. I'm the living bread. Just 
<laughs> right? No, it's just, it's never identical repetition, just circling around the theme. I'm the living bread. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. Oh, let me be very clear. The bread that I offer for the life of the world is my flesh. What? Cannibalism? <laughs> like what? This flesh? Right? And Jesus does nothing to diffuse the situation. Look at what he says here. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and then he adds a new one, drink his blood. Now you've already been told that Jesus is liquid, he's water, and he's already turned liquid water into wine, but now you're drinking, you got, oh, I can't draw blood in blue here, I've got to draw it in red, okay, all right, so bread, and blood. Now, again, think from John's perspective, right? This is, this is now decades after the event. So what have, what, what has the community around John been doing every single Sunday gathering? So are you with me? Eating the bread and drinking the cup. So John, he's even tuned the language of this debate into uh, Eucharist language. For sure, that's what he's done. So eating and drinking Jesus, um, which I, I mean, and I understand Protestants and Catholics, right? It's like, and uh, it's been a big debate here. Um, but I, I don't know, in Hebrew Bible mindset, it just makes sense. These are symbols. Right? They're symbols. So Jesus, you eat and drink Jesus, um, which uh, look at how the progression uh, keeps developing here. So what does it mean to eat my flesh and drink my blood? This is my, my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. And I in him. So that's interesting. So somehow eating and drinking Jesus makes Jesus be in you. And you in Jesus. Yeah? That's, that's a new thought. <laughs> I haven't come across that one before in John. And this is the first time this concept of, I'm just going to, I'm going to put JC here and you. And JC and you are meant to be in one another. And that theme is going to come to culmination here in John 17. So as the Father sent me, I live because of the Father. The one who eats me will live because of me. This is um, the bread. Now, hold on. We skipped something. Maybe it was earlier. This is chapter 6, right? Oh, it must have been right before we started. Oh, of course. <laughs> it was the line before where we started. What does it mean if you... So Jesus started this whole thing with the one who believes in me has eternal life. So if you believe in me, you have life. I am the bread of life. So what do you do with the bread of life? You eat it. What does it mean to eat Jesus? You believe in him. Do you see that whole thing? So believing becomes this way of... So it's about trusting Right? Trusting that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is for me, what I can't be for myself. And then eating becomes this powerful symbol of, of internalizing everything Jesus is. Of taking him into myself so that he becomes my, my life. Right? Bread is life. It's such a powerful symbol. Just take a long walk and think about it. Right? So, so believing, eating the bread and drinking the blood is the equivalent of trusting and believing, yeah? Which all, and all brings us all the way back to here, to the tale of two families. God's birthing a new family of those who trust and believe in the truly human one, in Jesus. Dude, what's happening right now? Okay, how you guys doing? Great. I'm gonna try to land the plane here. My goal is to get here. Is that okay? All right. So, tabernacles. Okay, I... Um, you're going to have to make decisions about how to do this. This is as you can, 7 through 10a. It's, chapter, it's 7 verse 1 through 10 verse like 20. 
And John's packed actually about uh, five different, depending on how you break it up, five or six different stories and conversations, all within tabernacles. So this, is, this includes where Jesus um, goes into uh, the temple and says, I'm the water of life. Um, and later on goes in and yells out, I am the light of the world. That's, those two stories are in here. Um, each one of those causes huge debates and conversations like the one we just read. Um, s- stuck in the middle here is the, uh, Jesus and the adulterous woman where they bring the woman to stone her and he, he doesn't. And it's bracketed and in your footnotes it says not in the earliest manuscripts of John. <laughs> Do you know this one? Okay, so that'll keep you up at night for a couple days. And then you'll work it out, and it'll be okay. Um, but, so yeah, it's true. Like this, there's a story here in the middle of this section um, that seems to have been in John 2.0. John edition 2, but wasn't in the earliest edition of John. Um, is a likely solution to what's going on there. So, that's in the middle here. Um, and then a whole, just a whole bunch of dialogues. It's a hard section to outline. So my recommendation would be when you get to this section, um, if, you, if you want to stick with doing, you know, just one message or one class on each of these, is take a more thematic approach to this section and do something about Jesus as the water and as the light. Um, at least that would be my, my recommendation. That's one thought. Just one, tabernacles. Um, Tabernacles recalls what time period? Wilderness, right? You're in the tents. So even when you go into the land, live seven days of the year as if you are not in the land. That's interesting. Um, And when Israel was wandering in the wilderness, what did God provide for them? Many times. Water. The water narratives dominate the wilderness stories. Jesus marches into <laughs> right the temple courts and says, yeah, chapter 7. Uh, anybody, do you remember? The last and greatest, yes. Uh, verse, yeah, 37, here it is. Yep, that's right. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And the one who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Oh, man. Okay, can I just show you one thing? Oh, dude. This was, I had never seen this uh, before about six months ago. Um, so, uh, this is a, in page 14 with, in the notes here. Jesus is depicted as Lady Wisdom again. Okay, all right. There's actually different translations of that line that we just read. Jesus says, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Uh, NIV and these other translations say, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So the mental image is of, oh, if I believe in Jesus... What happens to me, metaphorically? I have a a spring of living water coming out of me, right? I've got a river of life flowing out of me. (laughs) So here's the trick. Hyper-literal translation of the Greek is right here. If someone is thirsty, let them come to me and let them drink. The one who believes in me. Just as scripture says, rivers from his belly will flow living water. So the question is, whose belly? (laughs) Grammatically, in terms of the grammar and syntax of how you translate this sentence, whose belly? Um, All these translations assume that the one who believes in me is the one whose belly. Are you with me? However, equally grammatically possible is that the one who believes in me, that this is the subject of the thirsty and let them come. In other words, if someone, namely the one who believes in me, is thirsty, let the believing ones come to me and drink. As scripture says, 
rivers from his belly. And on that interpretation, the his is someone other than the believer. Are you with me? No rivers of life flowing out of you. Rather, you're coming to someone else that is the source of the river of life. Now let me ask you, which one actually makes a more coherent sense of the water theme? It makes more sense uh, that the water is coming from Jesus' belly and that the believer is the one who comes to Jesus and drinks from his belly. That's interesting. Are you guys tracking with me? So, and there are some translations that take that. Here's a New Living Translation. Anyone who believes in me, come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Well, who is the his? Can I think of a story where um, somebody um, in the wilderness, uh, where something was struck in the wilderness and became a source of living water for God's people in the desert. Can I think of that story? There's, there's uh, two of them, right? Of Moses striking the rock, yeah? Um, and what story are we remembering? This is right here. This is the story it's right here, right? So it's already on our minds of striking the rock. So, uh, you know, do with this what you will. Um, in... The book of Numbers, where, sorry, I really nerded out on this. Okay, all right. In the book of Numbers, this is on what, page 17 of the notes. In the book of Numbers, Exodus 17, this is the first water in the wilderness story. The Lord said to Moses, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock. This is Yahweh speaking to Moses. I'm going to stand on the rock. You strike the rock. And water comes out. Are you tracking with me? It just says it right there. I'm going to stand on the rock. Then you strike the rock. And water will come out. Now, within uh, the Hebrew Bible, is rock a common way of talking about the God of Israel? Yep, here's four examples. (laughs) In really famous, important poems. uh, Where God is just called the rock. So Moses strikes the rock upon which, right? You you guys get where I'm going here? Yeah, Yeah, totally. Um, In the same way, in Numbers 20, God said to Moses, speak to the rock. But what does Moses do? He strikes the rock. Um, Do you remember that place in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about our ancestors um, drank from the spiritual rock that followed them around the wilderness? Do you remember that story? Or that comment? There it is, right there. In First Corinthians. And do you know who that rock was, Paul says? Yeah, that was Messiah. The rock was the Messiah. So, so Paul's got this concept. There's two rock stories on either side of Mount Sinai of the rock being struck. And so there developed this tradition. Um, here's just one example of it in an early uh, Jewish Aramaic translation that talked about the well following them around the wilderness. <laughs> Because Moses struck it when they left Egypt, and he struck it when they're on the way to the promised land. And um, the rock is a common name for the God of Israel. And in the other one story, the rock, God's standing on the rock when Moses hits it. Now, okay, so if, that, if that's the case, if Jesus is the source of the water in a story about tabernacles where God provided water in the wilderness when the rock was struck, are you guys tracking with me? Okay? Can I think of another story in the Gospel of John where the Messiah is struck so that water flows out of him? Are you tracking with me? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And it's, it's odd because you have, right, Jesus here and he's got this Roman soldier, right, who pierces his side with a lance, and we're told what flowed out of him. So water and blood. Now there's been a lot of explanations about this based on like medical science and stuff like that, and that's interesting. There's no way that's what John was thinking about. You know what I'm saying? Like (laughs) water and blood, you guys, water and blood. It makes perfect sense. So cryptic riddle comments here are all illuminated in the moment of Jesus' death. And he's already told you that's how it means to think as a Christian. 
which means to view every single thing in your life as a way of relating to and understanding Jesus. And so every, <laughs> this is everything in the Hebrew Bible becomes symbols for him to illuminate the gift of God's love in life in the, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Do you see how this section works? We did m- many examples. Um, but dude, this section's amazing. And uh, there's at least eight messages here, uh, if not more. But at least I hope this is a helpful aerial tour. Okay, great. I think I... I th- Am I supposed to stop talking now? 2.14. Yeah, let's take a break.